All right. So welcome again to Talking Trout. We're, we're glad to have you with us. Um, we're going to start doing these again every Wednesday night, first Wednesday of the month, um, 8 o'clock. Uh, we got some good guests lined up this fall, so um, I'll keep sending out the emails and let everybody know what's, what's coming up. But um, we're pretty excited to have Tracy Haynes here tonight from the Wisconsin Wetlands Association. Um, he's someone that I've had the pleasure of getting to know a little bit over the years through some of Trout Unlimited's advocacy work and, uh, you know, some of the on the ground work that we're doing with, uh, you know, as far as restoration work and how that that blends in with some of the work that the folks of the Wisconsin Wetlands Association are doing. So um, I, I think, Tracy, we're going to let you jump right into it. And, and maybe if you could, for those of us who, who might not be familiar with you, if you could just take a minute and kind of introduce yourself to us and maybe give us a, a brief like background of how you got into this, how you got into wetlands. How did I get into this? Right. Okay. Um, well, let me see if I can share my screen and then I'll get up and we'll start the program. You see the screen shared? Yeah, that looks great. Okay, I got the first slide up. Is that right? Yep, you're good okay, to go. Great. Wonderful. All right, let's dive in then. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out uh, on a Wednesday night uh, when the weather's finally starting to get a little nicer outside. Um, I'm Tracy Hames, Executive Director with Wisconsin Wetlands Association. I've been in this position for about 10 years now. Uh, spent much of my career uh, uh, doing uh, large amounts of uh, uh, wetland and floodplain um, management, restoration, and protection on uh, some real important cell-mounted waterways uh, in eastern Washington state on an Indian reservation, the Yakima Nation uh, Reservation. Uh, so I've been back in Midwestern at heart. I've been back here about 10 years. Happy to be back in Wisconsin and working with uh, folks uh, to help protect and restore the wetlands and the resources uh, in Wisconsin. So let's dive on in today. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, wetlands, watersheds, and cold water resources. Why do trout people? Why should trout people care about wetlands? And how can wetlands be important to uh, the management and the, and the care of our our cold water resources? So let's dive in. Let's see. Can I get this to move? Oh. I went one, one too far. Let's see if I can get back. There we go. So our organization, Wisconsin Wetlands Association, we're just over 50 years old. We're a nonprofit, science-based, nonpartisan uh, organization, mostly of wetland scientists and people that care about wetlands. Statewide, we're a membership organization. And in a nutshell, we help communities and people see wetlands as solutions to the water issues uh, that they're having in their area. Uh, so we've decided that with all the wetland loss we've had in Wisconsin, the best way to get wetlands back on the landscape to the scale that we need is to get to people understand why wetlands are important to the things they already care about. In other words, not trying to get them to care about ducks and frogs and pretty flowers if they don't already, but why are wetlands important for roads and infrastructure and flooding, et cetera, et cetera. And let's see. It didn't didn't move. Let's see. Oh, no. So it's kind of it's I'm kind of delayed on my on my moving of slides. So I always like to start out by saying, what are wetlands? Getting everybody on the same page. When you talk to scientists, they'll give you convoluted uh, uh, definitions of what wetlands are. But for the purposes of this talk, uh, remember that wetlands are those places in between the areas that are always dry and the areas that are always wet. So because of that, it's the transition zone. And in the transition zone, some wetlands are closer to the always dry and some wetlands are closer to the always wet. And it's the water conditions that, uh, that provide the foundation for the types of vegetation and wildlife and fish, et cetera, that will be uh, using the wetlands. So in between always dry and always wet, transitional, remember that. Because of that, there's many different types. So how do wetlands help manage cold water systems? We're going to talk a bit about how water moves through watersheds and some of the impacts that have occurred to wetlands in watersheds. Wetlands are the great managers, managers of our water flowing through watersheds. And uh, 
generally speaking, when we're talking in this subject, we talk about upper watershed wetlands and floodplain wetlands. And today, because maybe a lot of you have heard me give talks, I've been speaking to several chapters uh, this last year. Uh, we're going to kind of geek out uh, on this talk and talk a lot about floodplain wetlands and what floodplains are, why they're important, and how we can restore them. But we're going to start out with a little uh, video um, about how wetlands manage water. Do you remember fishing with your grandpa, catching frogs at the water's edge? Some of these precious childhood memories of nature tie back to wetlands. Wetlands occur between the places that are always wet and the places that are always dry. Not only do they give us great memories, they also protect the health and safety of our communities. They reduce flood damages, help keep our waters clean, and ensure we have water to drink and use in our businesses. But the ability of wetlands to provide these benefits depends on how we use and manage our land and water. Across much of the state, the changes we have made to our landscape have disrupted this ability. And as a result, we're seeing more flood damages and water quality problems. The good news is that wetlands can be an important part of the solutions to these problems. And by understanding how wetlands work, we can begin the exciting process of restoring wetlands to help heal Wisconsin's waters. Because water flows downhill, we can't fix issues downstream if we don't fix problems upstream. So let's start at the top and look at how it's all connected. The watershed. A watershed is an area where all surface waters, lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands, drain to a shared body of water. But wetlands in different parts of a watershed manage water in different ways. Wetlands in the upper parts of a watershed form in low spots on the land. These wetlands capture, store, and slowly release runoff from rain and snowmelt. They may not always look like wetlands. They're wet in spring and dry by late summer, and often they don't even appear to be connected to streams or rivers, but they are critical. Here's how. Individually, these wetlands may be small, but they can be locally abundant. Together, they hold and manage a lot of water and literally slow the flow, allowing the water to soak into the ground. This reduces erosion and flood peaks and helps protect downstream roads and neighborhoods. Wetlands in the middle part of the watershed form along rivers and creeks, giving them room to swell during high water. They are most commonly known as floodplain wetlands. When floodwaters spread out across a floodplain, they slow down and spread out. Slow removing water has less erosion causing energy and water that can spread out means lower flood peaks downstream. Wetlands in the lower parts of a watershed form where rivers empty into larger bodies of water, especially lakes. Where rivers flatten out, the current disperses and the river drops its load of sediments and other material. This makes the water that enters the lake cleaner and clearer, which means better fishing, swimming, and boating. So are the wetlands near you healthy and abundant enough to support watershed health, or are they too damaged to do the work you need them to do? If you don't know the answer, you're not alone. But if you're concerned about water quality and flooding and care about fish and wildlife, encouraging your community to explore how local wetlands are or are not supporting watershed health is a great place to start. Working together, we can use wetlands as solutions in our communities. And at the same time, we can ensure that our kids and grandkids create the same treasured childhood memories we hold dear. to apologize we didn't have any cartoon people fly fishing in that uh, video but uh, uh, close enough uh, so to review you know the video talked about upper watershed wetlands and how those how important those are and that'll be another talk for another day uh, but also how well healthy floodplains are crucial to the health of our waterways and what happens uh, with our fish and wildlife and uh, other resources and here's a picture of a healthy floodplain actually in the driftless area um, a lot of our wetlands or a lot of our floodways, rivers and creeks in Wisconsin look like this historically, and we've uh, really changed the way um, our rivers and creeks look uh, today through a lot of, you know, 100 plus years of uh, alteration. But we'll talk about some of that here in a few minutes. 
if I can get this to change. And with the loss of our floodplains, uh, we've had a lot of issues. We have flooding going on in places where we don't want to have normally have water. We've got our rivers running dirty. The picture on the left actually has uh, abundant uh, floodplain and upper watershed wetlands. The, the river on the right does not. And by the way, these are two adjacent watersheds. These photos were taken 45 minutes apart at the same uh, uh, runoff event. Uh, these are up in Bayfield County. So you can really see the difference in, in what happens when uh, we lose our wetlands and floodplains. Our rivers dry up. When we lose our floodplains, we lose our ability oftentimes to store base flow. And uh, later on in the summer, uh, we can have uh, pretty tough conditions. It's hard for a fish to live in this situation here. And our roads are washing out. We've had a lot of problems in the last several years. We're getting a lot of more storms that seem to be increasing intensity and localized. And we'll have areas where a foot of rain will drop overnight in one, in one area and cause, you know, oftentimes millions of dollars in damage. This is a photo up near Ashland. In one rain event in 2016, uh, over $35 million in public infrastructure damage occurred literally from an overnight rain. And that's because a lot of our watersheds now don't have the capacity to handle uh, the rain events and the snow belt and the run events that they had uh, historically. And our communities are suffering. Uh, once again, the Ashland, all those red dots on the right, those are road washouts in, in just in, in one place, the town of Ashland, which is just south of the city of Ashland. That's really expensive when your culverts blow out every other every couple of years. Now, by the way, there's a, a really big coalition of folks working in this area in the Marengo watershed to start looking at how we can bring back wetlands and other features to help mitigate for these uh, large scale rain events and Trout Unlimited uh, is, a, is an important partner in that effort. Okay, why didn't we move? So how do we turn this around? How do we fix this stuff? What we do is we need the right amounts of the right kinds of actions in the right locations. And from the you know, fancy word for that is hydrologic restoration, what I call fixing the water. When we look at things from a watershed perspective and look at what has changed, how can we bring back some of these uh, features that existed historically? It provides multiple benefits, reducing flooding, water quality, groundwater, base flow, infrastructure, on and on. So a lot of the work we're doing is trying to show how wetlands are a part of uh, fixing the water. Someone uh, needs to mute themselves. I'm hearing some, uh, some sounds in the background. Oh, there it goes again. Um, and that means taking the watershed approach like we had in the video. And today we're gonna, we're gonna look most closely at uh, floodplains. How do we reconnect floodplains? What's happened in Wisconsin with our floodplains and floodplain wetlands? And why are they important and, and what can we do? So let's dive on in and talk about floodplains. Like I said, many of our rivers and creeks flowing in Wisconsin, this is in the Driftless, but all throughout Wisconsin, oftentimes flowed through meadow systems, flat, flat floodplains with meandering channels, many times multiple channels and, um, and high water tables through these things, good base flow, et cetera. And a lot of this has been lost over time, especially due to agricultural practices throughout the state. And when we lose our floodplains, we reduce the ability to, um, for the water to handle you know, the runoff when it comes. So we, we increase the flood problems in our communities, in our neighborhoods. And because this is a science talk, I'm legally obligated to show a graph. And this is a picture of a hydrograph of the Yakima River in a place where I used to work uh, most of my career. For 20 plus years, I was out in, in the Yakima Basin. And this is a hydrograph uh, from one rain on snow flood event in January 2009. Now the blue line is a, a gauging station on the Yakima River at a place called Parker. And the green is at a place called Grandview. Now Grandview is about 30 to 40 miles downstream from the Parker gauge. And look at the way the behavior occurred here. This was a situation where you have a river that a lot of the hydrology is mountain based. So in a, in a winter where there's a lot of snow in the mountains, 
Every now and then a big warm front will come in off of the Pacific Ocean. These are the Cascade Mountains and dump rain over top of all that snow. When that happens, all that water comes down the hill all at once, right? And you get these big floods. Well, in 2009, that happened in January. So Parker, the upstream gauge rose from about 3000 CFS. You can see on the, on the bottom left on January 5th, by the 7th, it jumped up to about 33,000 CFS in about a one day, that's a lot of water. And then it dropped almost just as fast uh, uh, after, after that big flood event. That's a very flashy event right there. Grandview, look at that, it, it rose much more slowly and peaked at about a 30% lower level than it did at Parker. Now that's the same water passing Parker goes then downstream and passes Grandview. Actually, there's a couple of tributaries entering uh, between there. So there's more water passing through Grandview, but the flood peak was much lower. And why is that? The reason is in between Parker and Grandview, this is the Parker gauge, this is Grandview, and this is the Yakima River coming down uh, between the two, is really healthy and uh, abundant floodplains along the Yakima River. Above Parker, if you can see here, it's very narrow and canyonated, and uh, that produces the flashy flows coming out of the mountains because there's nothing to slow that down. So this is a really good example of the power of floodplains, just looking at the, the flood uh, behavior in those two locations. And if you look down at the bottom, you see the 10 miles that we're, we're panned back quite a bit. And just for, for um, context, that river in the upper right of this photo is the Columbia River. And here's a couple of close up pictures of the floodplain above Parker. One of the wider areas is that orange bar on the left. Uh, and that's the city of Yakima filling in a bunch of the floodplain. And uh, on the right side above the Grand View is, is the floodplain that, that you have along the river there. And it's about two and a half times wider or more than it is up above Parker. So in that situation, the floodplains really helped slow the flow down, spread it out, reduce the energy, and it made a big difference um, from one spot to the other. The power of floodplains. Now here's how floodplains work. And the thing to really important that's, you know, that's really important to remember is that floodplains are flat, right? Floodplains are flat, remember that. And in a healthy situation like the, like the upper graphic here, that's the least erosive. The way floodplains work in the value is the channel, when, when the flows come through the channel, the, the water rises and it spreads out across this flat floodplain. And that reduces the energy, slows the flow down, allows that flow to recharge back into the groundwater and kind of repeat the cycle. When you disturb your floodplain with levees or problems upstream, et cetera, and are bringing, bringing in uh, confined flows that can't spread out on a floodplain, then the channel has to change its shape to accommodate for those larger flows. We're asking the, the river channel to handle more flows than it did historically, right? So what happens? It erodes and it makes itself bigger. There's a larger cross section to handle the flows it's being asked to handle uh, periodically during those runoff events. And so the amount of water in the two figures in this slide are the same amount. The lower, uh, the lower graphic where the floodplain is disconnected, the channel has widened itself to accommodate the same amount of water that passes through on the upper one, but on the upper one is spreading out and it's uh, engaging with the floodplain. And oftentimes what happens when you get too much water flowing through and no floodplain connection, the river will dig itself deeper and deeper and deeper. It's called incision. It incises down into the landscape and it takes then, once that happens, it takes a bigger and bigger flood before it will connect with the floodplain and provide all the benefits that floodplains provide. So we kind of, it kind of turns into a positive feedback loop. Things get more and more unraveled as, uh, as these flood flows come through without floodplains. And it's always also important to remember that floodplains are messy. 
because they're flood, you know, areas where floods come, there's a lot of debris, there's a lot of wood, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's hard to walk through a real healthy floodplain because of all the wood and things going on. And the wood's good. That's important for our trout waters for a couple of reasons. One, it produces a lot of uh, uh, aquatic invertebrates, but it also slows the flow down. The debris, the wood, the vegetation in a healthy floodplain acts like friction. So when the water spreads out, all that vegetation, all that stuff in the floodplain, the messiness slows that water down, reduces the energy, you know, reduces the fire hose effect uh, pointing at that bridge or culvert downstream. And here's how it works. So you look on the upper left here, this poor guy got thrown out of his airplane and he doesn't have a parachute. So he's gonna fall down when he hits the ground, ouch, that's gonna hurt. And that's what happens when we remove our floodplain by straightening or other things the, the bottom left photo, there's a lot of energy moving down there. Connecting your floodplains gives you that parachute. So the guy on the, on the right is gonna go down, he's gonna have a soft landing, just like the river is or the creek or whatever that is on the lower right. Uh, the friction reduces the energy, reduces the erosiveness, and provides the good habitat that we need. And let's see if I can get this to move. There. Uh, floodplain wetlands also help uh, keep channel form healthy as well. This is up in the Pinocchi Hills. This is a really nice floodplain uh, sedge meadow in a place called Bullgus Creek, class one trout stream. And when I first took this picture, I was walking out into this floodplain it was about two feet deep walking towards the channel in the middle of July, right? Dry time of year. I got to the channel. I said, oh, good. I'll stand in the channel, take a picture of this beautiful wetland floodplain and look at the energy reduction. Look at all the, all the vegetation that's going to capture flows, drop out sediment, you know, et cetera. So I took one step into that channel and whoosh, went right up to my neck a very narrow and deep channel running through this area. And it's because we had the healthy floodplains here, that's what allowed that channel to maintain that really good shape and the vegetation like grasses and sedges that help hold onto the bank, the bank form. If that floodplain wasn't there, the big runoffs, and you get about 200 plus inches of snow in this habitat every winter, if that water flowed off all at once, this would be a big blown out channel, but it's the flood, it's the, the friction and the erosion reduction of the floodplains up here that allow that channel to be so healthy for trout. So here's what's happened in a lot of our watersheds in Wisconsin. Uh, this is actually, uh, originally was drawn in, in a mountainous area, but it's the same thing has happened here. We'll have a broad floodplain historically. We'll decide we want to farm in it or do other things. So what do we do? We take our river, which was probably a multi-channeled situation with wetlands, and we move it over to the side of the floodplain area and ditch it and straighten it out and disconnect the river from moving through its floodplain as it did historically. And that does a lot of things. Like we talked about, it increases the energy. It provides a fire hose effect pointing downstream. And by removing that floodplain, you're actually lowering the groundwater levels as well. So you might have incision in the channel, which cuts it down deeper and deeper. And that acts like an agricultural drain pulling the groundwater off. So not only are you, are you having flashier floods, you're not recharging the groundwater associated with your river and channel. And that's a, gonna be a reduction in base flow during the dry time of the year when you really need it. So a lot of these things kind of all come together uh, when, when we remove our floodplains. And this is more common than not in so many of our waterways in Wisconsin right now, you'll see that river moved over to the edge. Another way that channels react to loss of floodplain is by uh, widening themselves. Uh, sometimes they incise deeper and deeper into the channel, but if there's a hard base or something that, that makes it hard to dig deeper, then they'll just start spreading out laterally and they'll become really wide and shallow. We've all seen these places where you can walk across some of these streams and it's hardly above ankle deep a lot of times uh, during much of the year. So how do we fix that? In the Little Plover River, where there's a lot of folks doing some work right now, this was the problem. On the left-hand side, before restoration was done, Little Plover River, because of flashiness and because of a lot of reasons, 
wetland loss a big part of it. It became very flashy and the river responded by getting very wide and very shallow. You could walk the whole Little Plover River and hardly ever even go above knee deep um, uh, water level, oftentimes just shin deep, but, but it was 30 to 40 foot wide Whereas historically it was about you know a fourth of that of that width, so some of the simple work that was done in that area was opening up sunlight into the area to get the grasses and sedges growing, and then using some of the cuttings to help you know jumpstart things by narrowing down the creek, forcing it to be to 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 be narrow and deep, and when you do that, you're changing the cross-sectional uh, ability or, or, or aspects of the channel and you're allowing it then at a much lower flood event to spread out on the floodplain. Now this picture was taken right after these bundles were put in. I'm happy to report now a few years later, they're all covered over. They've all been filled in with sediment now. The river channel is maintaining its, its narrow shape and vegetation is growing right over top all this work right now. It's looking really nice in there. Another way to manage our floodplains uh, is to get in with cattle, grazing, fire, forest thinning, all these things that we can use to promote the right types of vegetation, helps hold our banks, helps provide that friction. But along with that, we have to have the floodplain reconnection if we're gonna realize all the benefits of the vegetation. We let trees grow up and they shade out the grasses and the trees have larger roots. They don't hold the bank things can really get out of whack uh, when, when you have a tree dominate, dominated system uh, that wasn't there historically. So let's talk a little bit about the driftless area. The driftless is such a unique area. It's almost like many little mini uh, mountain, mountain watersheds. Uh, but uh, historically the driftless, a lot of people say didn't have many wetlands. Well, they did because the wetlands were associated with the valleys on all these creeks and rivers and channels in the driftless area. And what happened over time, we, we changed the nature with agriculture, the way water flows across there. And a lot of the places that had grasses and oak savannas and things like that got developed to crop lands. And a lot of the water that used to soak into the ground now goes right down those hills, right into the flats. And when that happened historically, it created these big gullies and these big chasms going down these hills in the driftless area. This is a picture in Grant County. Above it is about a 40 acre uh, parking lot. And that's the top of the hill right there. And it gets worse as you go down. So we've lost the ability of our watersheds in the driftless to hold on to snow melt and, and rain. It goes right down like a big chute down to the bottom. And when it does that, it carries a lot of sediment. So what happened in a lot of the driftless area was we buried our historic floodplains. So these waters used to spread out and, and a lot of these driftless ones, the rivers and creeks, cold water features were running through sedge meadows, really high groundwater table. We, we developed the upland areas, all that dirt went down and there's places where it's four to six feet of deposition over top of the floodplain. Well, that kind of creates an incised condition, even though it's not incised, it's kind of buried. So now it takes a much bigger flood before that water can spread out into those new floodplains. And uh, what that's happened, what's that done then is it's caused these channels to change their shape. So we have these bigger, wider channels now, and a lot of them are digging deeper. This is the West Fork Kickapoo River. And you can see uh, on the left, there's a layer of deposition and we know where the deposition stops because it becomes a real black layer of soil. That was the old wetland soil. And since, since the deposition time, not only has the floodplain been buried under X feet of, of, of dirt, it's then incising even deeper yet. So it takes one heck of a flood for this uh, area here to engage with its floodplain. So what are we getting? We're getting erosion. We're getting uh, you know, sediment moving downstream. We're blowing out our culverts. We're losing our trout habitat. Uh, and we're losing our base flow. This river should, you know, a healthy river would be much higher up on the landscape here with a much narrower channel. And here's a really good uh, cross section showing that wetland soil layer. Here's an area, another area in Grant County. And you can see the black, black soil layer. That was the sedge meadow that this creek uh, flowed through historically. And there's a little bit of, of sedimentation or you know, alluvium on over top of this, but it's not too bad. 
Uh, there's about a foot or two of, uh, of, uh, of sediment uh, burying this floodplain. These things are fixable. Now, when we think about how do we restore all these buried floodplains we have in the driftless area and actually throughout the state of Wisconsin, we've, you know, this isn't just, this alluvium hasn't just occurred in the driftless. Many of our wetlands, many of our floodplains have been buried throughout uh, the state. And I like to think about it uh, as a catastrophic event. We went in in a very for short period of time developed a lot of agriculture all at once in these areas and the farming practices at the time caused this erosion and all that soil to, to go down and, and bury our floodplains. What do we do about it? A lot of people say, well, we should dig out all that dirt and put the river back to where it was historically. Well, that's a big task. That's a lot of stuff, especially when you've had as much deposition as we had. So think about it this way. This is a photo of Toppenish Creek uh, right on the edge of a, of a mountain ridge on the, on the bottom part. The brown part is hard to tell, but it's a, it's a pretty steep ridge. And this was a landslide uh, hundreds of years ago, a piece of this ridge broke off and buried Toppenish Creek right there. So now the creek goes up and around that old slide, right? That's a catastrophic event, creating a new normal, an act of God. Um, nobody would go in on a situation like this and say, we should dig out that landslide and put the river back where it was historically. People understand that that's, that's a lot of work and uh, it's the new normal now. I would argue and, and put it folks mind that maybe we had the same type of thing in the driftless area in Wisconsin when all that alluvium came down. Maybe we need to think about a different way of restoring our lower waterways uh, than, than digging out all that alluvium. Dig it out where we can and where it's cost effective that's probably not going to be something we can do across the landscape. So what do we do? We want to reconnect floodplains in these areas. And uh, there's a lot of simple solutions to this. This is Black Earth Creek. And I know TU is involved in this work. This is just uh, east of Mazamani. And a really nice uh, floodplain in a lot of uh, Black Earth Creek. I think it's a trout one, or a class one trout stream, maybe class two, I'm not sure. Not sure. But here they actually did remove some of the alluvium and they got a new floodplain in here. And uh, it's really helping reduce the energy and maintaining a uh, good channel form and, uh, and habitat. And the way they did that, and of course my arrow isn't working well, they, they also installed a lot of these things that we call vortex weirs. You guys may be familiar with these uh, rock structures. They're V-shaped um, structures with the point of the V pointing upstream. And what they do is they help uh, create a pool and a riffle uh, naturally in your trout stream. And they're used a lot for trout habitat here, but uh, in a lot of places, they also act really well as grade controls. So in some of these areas where the, where the river's been incised or it's been buried, you can actually lift your river back up to engage in the floodplain with these types of structures. And I've had a lot of experience using these things out west. And here's an example of one uh, on that same creek, Toppenish Creek. Here we had an incised, uh, very important steelhead waterway, cold water fishery, and it was cut down and we lifted it four feet at this location with these two uh, vortex weirs, and we call them grade controls. And here, th these are actually literally five foot wide columnar basalt uh, rocks building these things, very inexpensive to, to create. And they create a flow that does not provide a fish passage barrier. They're different than beaver dams or straight line weirs. And I'll show you in a minute how they flow. But after a few years, you know, this was during construction. A couple of years later, it all looked like this. It vegged in really well and it was working really nicely. These were put in over 10 years ago. They look just as good as new today. So here's how water flows through one of these types of uh, vortex weir situations. I'll, I'll show you a little video here. This was taken a couple of winters ago. I was actually out there duck hunting. Uh, this was in January. So the water is going over the rocks. Instead of curling under towards the rocks, it flows out and digs a nice little pool beneath the rocks and deposits the, the dirt down below it, creating a riffle. You can see the nice even flow. Any adult or juvenile fish could go up or down through this structure with no problem at all. There's the second one dropping it down. So a total lift of four feet here. 
and uh, they work really well. They they're stable. They're very inexpensive, and uh, they can really be a good tool to help uh, erase some of the excision and re reconnect uh, floodplains uh, in some of our areas. So we'll we'll review again uh, uh, this area here where we where we showed before the the graphic of the of the river channel moved across the side. How do you reconnect this floodplain? Um, let's use a real world example. This is once again Topnish Creek in the area where I used to work in this exact location here. I'll show you how we did it. This is what it looked like beforehand. There was a channel moved over to the side of the floodplain and literally 10 to 12 foot high eroded banks. And they'd been that way for a very long time because look at on the right, you can see the oak trees and the, and the person standing there. Uh, this had been a big fire hose for a long, long time. How do you fix this? How do you lift that creek up? How do you get that floodplain in, engaged again? So the way it was with, a, with some of these rock control structures, this is the same picture as this but with the grade controls installed after a couple of years, lifted it up. Now it's engaging with its uh, floodplain. The vegetation is growing lushly and the water's flowing right through. This is at low flow on top of this creek and, and uh, providing very good trout habitat. And here's looking downstream at some of these things. When you're doing it, when you wanna make sure you're, you're maintaining fish passage, you wanna use, you wanna lift about a foot and a half to two feet at the most per control structure. And here, you, you know, you can lift a creek up pretty high in a very short stretch. Takes a little bit bigger rock than the vortex wears we're using right now, but it's a very cost effective tool of uh, re-engaging. And a lot of times our floodplains have been levied off. So not only did we move the channel to the edge of the floodplain, we put a levee to keep it there. And so a lot of times with the grade controls then, you want to breach the levees at certain elevations then and allow engagement in the right locations uh, in floodplains uh, uh, where you can provide the floodplain benefits without causing the, the problems. So once again, this area here then is re-engaged. It flows and it floods at a drop of a hat and uh, the, the groundwater is back up and things are looking really good. Let me talk about something that's happening right now uh, in Wisconsin. There's a demo project that we're just starting to build partnerships on, and it's north of Richland Center. It's a floodplain reconnection project, and uh, it's on a place called Fancy Creek. Maybe some, some of you have heard of it. Uh, lower portions of Fancy Creek is, uh, I think, a class two trout waterway. And uh, this is a photo on the left of what it looks like today. There's a landowner that owns about a mile of, of Fancy Creek with a broad floodplain. And if you look at the picture, you'll see a channel meandering through there, but then you'll also see a straight line. Back in the 1940s, a big ditch was dug draining the Fancy Creek area for who knows why. Maybe they wanted to, thought they were going to develop farmland in there. It never worked. But now the creek itself has been captured by the agricultural ditch. The natural channel is about six to eight feet above the bottom of the ditch. And uh, so the ditch now flows, you know, brings flashy uh, floodwaters and, and the floodplain is, is very rarely engaged now. It takes a big flood to engage uh, the lower Fancy Creek floodplain. And on the, on the right, you see the 1937 photo before that ditch was dug and you can see the natural channel. The neat thing about this project is the channel is still there and the wetland basins and all the features of the floodplain still exist. The only change that's happened has been that big ditch has been dug. So there's a, a lot of partners coming together to look at this. Can we bring this floodplain back up? Can we bring the creek back up into its old channel and get the floodplain acting like a floodplain again? And here's a picture of that big ditch. It's very large and it takes a huge flood before that engages and does all the good things that happen in floodplains. Here's Bob Pearson from DOT. I think Bob, are you on? Uh, thought I saw your name on the on the participants tonight. Uh, Bob's about six foot tall, more than six foot tall, so you can see how far down that is uh, from the uh, from the original floodplain. This is him standing in the ditch once again about shin deep water. And if you go up on the floodplain itself, it's really good habitat up there yet. This is all sedges. And so, and the channel is running just past uh, the folks here. Um, 
in much smaller capacity. So the idea is, can we erase the effects of the ditch? And, and we don't know exactly yet engineering wise how that's gonna happen, maybe with grade controls. We're, we're, it's so early on, we haven't done design yet, but get the water flowing back up here again. There's still decent groundwater in this area or, or, or wet conditions because there's groundwater coming laterally off the hills into this, even though the uh, big ditches is lowering those groundwaters. It's still in fairly decent shape. So literally what we wanna do here is reconnect the channel and get that habitat back. Here's a, the picture of the channel down below. And, uh, and you can see what that channel looks like in comparison to the big ditch uh, that was dug. And it takes a lot of partners to do this kind of work. And, and we're just at the beginning stages of this, building the partnerships, putting together the monitoring, some assessment work, uh, trying to figure out how do we fund this stuff? How do we get people involved? And uh, uh, the nice thing about this project is at the bottom of it, this is on one piece of private land, is uh, a recently acquired DNR stream bank easement. So uh, right now TU isn't, hasn't been involved in this portion of the project yet but I think we will engage to you very, very soon and uh, get you guys uh, working on this along with us. It's not clear yet if this property will have public access, but it will be connected to a property that does have public access. And, and the idea right now is to do both those projects uh, uh, together and coordinate uh, uh, the floodplain reconnection work. And the, the trout folks are really excited about it and they wanna see that water getting back into that natural channel again. And it takes decision makers to get out there as well. So this is a uh, representative Oldenburg and, uh, and uh, Kurtz out on the site uh, early on, and they were really enthusiastic about this. And part of getting, you know, and I know we've been, we've been working with a lot of partners and Trout Unlimited is one of them through the Sporting Coalition for Wetlands getting a lot of our decision makers out in natural settings, in wetlands, in streams, looking at the issues, talking about the issues. And this was one of those events and it really made an impact on them. Uh, they, uh, Oldenburg was the main author of what is now Act 77 that just got signed by the governor uh, about a month ago. And it will really help provide a new general permit through DNR to conduct to make it much easier to conduct hydrologic restoration work uh, than is occurring right now. So here he was, you know, and, and a big part of it happened because he was brought out into these areas here. So let's get our, our folks together and, and get people understanding these issues and uh, get them out there. And just remember that, you know, so oftentimes we want to restore our waterways, we want to bring back floodplain like conditions. But we can't do that if the land doesn't flood. There's no shortcuts. If you want the conditions that floodplains provide, the land has to flood. This is a property, once again, on the Yakima River that I used to manage. Uh, on a big flood, it's three miles wide right here. And so that's what it takes to do this kind of work. And uh, hopefully in Wisconsin, then we'll be looking at this and, and thinking about ways and opportunities we can uh, use to bring back our floodplains. So that's it tonight. I'm happy to talk trout and answer any questions. And uh, there's a lot of stuff going on and a, a lot of uh, a lot of potential. So I'm really excited about where things are going and uh, trout are a big part of it. Hey, thanks, Tracy. That was a really informative uh, presentation that you put together and we appreciate you coming on and, and taking some time to explain some of that. And, and I think some of the graphics that that you and some of the folks of the Wisconsin Wellness Association put together just make it so much easier for like, like maybe somebody just joining trial limiter or, or somebody just, you know, a general person, the general public who may not be aware of the intricacies of how water works. And, and it really, you guys really do a good job of explaining it without getting too technical too quickly. So I'm sorry, I went long, but I always do. <laughs> no, that's great. I, I, really good stuff. I, um, I guess we'll leave the chat box open. If anybody's got questions, feel free to drop it in there. I think we've got a little bit of a smaller group tonight. Let's see, we've got like 43, 44 on right now. Um, you know, I, I guess if folks want to unmute and ask Tracy a question, I want to start out with talking about this. Um, you showed like the last slide just showed like a three mile wide floodplain. And when we think of something 
like fancy creek where you're talking about a small watershed like how how wide does that floodplain need to be is there like a mathematical can somebody look at and say okay this creek's right. x feet wide and it's so many feet deep and like we if, to make the floodplain work we need you know like 50 feet on either side of the bank or something yeah, like yeah. that so it, it does it takes hydrologists when you're doing this type of work you have to really take an interdisciplinary approach so none of us are smart enough to know all this stuff so we need to bring in you know we need the trout folks we also need hydrologists we need groundwater specialists we need vegetation people wildlife specialists on and on and one of the things that that we're a little bit um deficient in in wisconsin is if you go out west especially in in the irrigated west where you know where we're using our rivers and waterways to, to feed our farms we're measuring water everywhere it's easy to find hydrographs out west because there's so many gauges we have a real uh, uh we don't have nearly as many gauges as i would like to have here and fancy creek's a good example you can't just pull up a hydrograph for fancy creek and say this is where the big floods come and here's what's going on so you have to measure it and and do all the things that hydrologists do but yes you can then look at what's happened through watershed assessment look at the conditions upstream and look at the types of flows that lower fancy creek may be um, needing to you know to handle and then you can develop how wide a floodplain do we need there generally speaking when you have a floodplain like in Lower Fancy Creek that's still intact, but it's still there and it goes up to the hills, you know, off, off of it. That's the floodplain that existed historically, then yeah, that's probably a good idea of the size of the floodplain that you want to get back. Uh, and maybe you have more flashiness than you did historically. And then if you do, then we need to do some work upstream. But when you start on, on one part of a creek, oftentimes then it can grow as you all know and, and you get more landowners participating uh, in helping with the health. But yeah, a lot of this stuff is measured and uh, you have to do a lot of analysis to, uh, to understand what size you need. The, the picture we're looking at right now, I mean, on a big flood, we're talking over 60,000 CFS uh, on, on a Yakima River flood. That's, that's a lot of water coming down. So maybe Fancy so Creek doesn't need to be that big. Yeah. Yeah. So following up on that, like if you have, I guess Nate asked a question here, like, is there a percentage of a stream, you know, that needs a good floodplain to make it better? Or like if we're going into a situation like that, like how, how much do you need to, to make a difference? Like if we had a buffer strip on either side of the Creek, that was, you know, say 30 feet or 40 feet, like, is that going to make a difference? It, Everything helps, of course. And, and the neat thing is when you go around the state and especially in the driftless area and start looking at the condition of the waterways and, and the floodplains, especially in the driftless are in the lower areas, right? It comes off the big hills and then it goes into our channels and uh, we're trying to maintain habitat. And then these big gully washers come down and blow everything out. So we need to have a place to reduce that energy. and as you drive around, as you look at these watersheds, you know, sometimes there's crop fields right up to the, to the creek, right? It's hard to make a floodplain if you're growing corn there. But you find a lot of opportunities in different areas where we do have the ability to reconnect floodplains that wouldn't only, not only wouldn't hurt agriculture, but probably would benefit ag agriculture. And if we can start taking a watershed approach to some of these situations, working with communities, and like up in the Marengo River, which is also a very steep area up by Ashland, we're starting with the road crossings, you know, the places where they, they've washed out every year or every other year. We know where the problems are. We know something's out of whack. So let's look upstream in those catchments. Are there opportunities to reconnect floodplain? Are there opportunities to get uh, wetlands back? Anything we can do to hold on to that water? And 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 move from that direction so really let's start with where are our problems and and work from there and it's amazing when you take this perspective and you're thinking about where can i get floodplains reconnected 
I get really distracted driving around the driftless area because I see so many opportunities. I think, oh my God, we could reconnect there. Oh my God, yeah, there, there, there. And we don't necessarily have to impact cropland and, and other features oftentimes to get the adequate uh, floodplain habitat we need. It doesn't have to be top to bottom. Anywhere we can spread that water down, anywhere we can slow it and get it soaking into the ground, reducing that energy will, will be beneficial for the groundwater resources, for the trout habitat, for the channel form, and for all the infrastructure. So yeah, we just gotta be thinking floodplains. And, and I wanna say one thing, oftentimes, and it's a, it's a bit of semantics, because we've had so much erosion in some of our trout streams, a lot of times what we need to do is, is pull the bank back, right? And sometimes people call that floodplain connection and, and that's not floodplain connection. Um, that's solving a, a, a site specific erosion problem, but floodplains are flat. Remember that. And if you if you put the bank back, slope the bank back, you're actually increasing the cross section of that channel. And it actually will take a larger flood before it spreads out onto the flat area. So a lot of times people people use that term and, and it really isn't. It's it's uh, it's it's addressing an erosion issue, but it's not floodplain reconnection. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, it kind of segues into like Henry had a couple of questions here. Um, I guess first one is deposition a natural process that's accelerated by farming. Like, does deposition happen on its own? Yeah, uh, it does. Um, and and you know, a lot of folks when you're when you're working with creek, river, and 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 you know, channel hydrology. What what a lot of these hydrologists say is that rivers do two things. They move water and they move material. So the movement of material is what provides the trout habitat, right? They need gravels. And so without movement of gravels in your, in your waterway, you won't have spawning habitat, et cetera. So a floodplain is designed to capture sediments. Uh, in a natural situation on any flood, even where you have good healthy conditions, you will have sediments coming down your waterway during a during a runoff event. So the floodplains capture that. I mean, if you've been out in some of these floodplain areas, the vegetation might be just brown with sediment after the floods drop. You've probably all seen that. That's, guess what? That's sediment that isn't going downstream and choking up other areas there. Now, rivers move around. So what floodplains do is they give the ability of a river to over time move back and forth. And that is done by the movement of sediment, right? Sediment gets deposited over here. There's a little bit of erosion there. So over time, meandering happens, multiple channels oftentimes happen, but it's done in a very low energy environment. And that's what keeps the whole thing together. When we make that out of whack and we increase the energy, they call it increasing the stream power, then the erosion happens 10 times faster and things get out of whack really fast. Now in the driftless area where we've lost all our upper watershed capacity to manage water, we've already got a problem because that water is coming off of those hills really fast through those gullies. So, and we're not putting all that dirt back up in those gullies. We're not, we're not gonna be able to fix that. So we've got to doubly be thinking about how do we handle these increased flows that are coming down here with high sediment and, and that means finding opportunities to get floodplain uh, reconnection back in, slow that water, spread it out. Yeah, and I think Henry brought up another good point is, is that, you know, we talk about working with landowners and changing the, the land use patterns on the landscape. You know, if we want, in a lot of our agricultural areas, if we want more area dedicated to the floodplain, you know, that means a lot of times the farmer is going to have to give up some of his agricultural fields. Have you have you found is there a way to go in and compensate for them? Do you think do you think so that's something that organizations like us and you could be looking at um, yeah. in and the future NRCS, as a way to help our watersheds? Yeah, NRCS actually does have a program where they will pay an easement, uh, floodplain easement to take land out. I maintain that we can do a lot of good without 
having to take the cropland out. Many times we've got crops right in our floodplains, right? Or right next to our rivers. Well, maybe we lock those in. Maybe we've got opportunities in other places so we're not impacting the high value cropland. Uh, we don't have to have floodplains everywhere. And that's where this assessment and working with hydrologists and things is important. So can we spread the water out in the places that not only wouldn't be harmed by it, but maybe would benefit from it, whether it be a wildlife area, whether it be a pasture area. There's, it's amazing the number of places that, that you, the opportunities we have to slow this flow down in many, many, many of our watersheds. And so maybe at first we don't concentrate on cropland because that's a good way of getting the agricultural community, you know, not on board, right? Right. Oh boy, yeah. again, taking cropland out. Well, let's find ways of doing this that not only doesn't hurt agriculture, but benefits it. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And I think, you know, when we look strategically about the future and how we're going to operate, you know, from a restoration standpoint, I think that's the framework that we need to be working in. Like, we're not going to be able to convince farmers to sell their land. We need to be able to work with them and work on the land together to find solutions, you said. Solutions so. have to make sense to the landowner. Yep. An agricultural landscape, culturally it has to say, yeah, this benefits me, I wanna do this. And farmers are having runoff issues just like everybody else. So working together in these landscapes to slow that energy down and to protect the channel and the groundwater is is to everybody's advantage. Maybe different people are, are are taking different perspectives on it, but but there's ways of doing this. And Little, Little Plover River is a good example. You know, a lot of different people coming together with different interests, and uh, and a lot of things are happening on the ground with very little impact uh, to agriculture. In fact, a lot of benefits to certain parts of the agriculture. Certainly circle irrigation is coming out, but the farmers are doing it voluntarily and they want it to happen, but other things are going on as well. And, uh, and it's really exciting when you allow agriculture to take a leadership role in this kind of work, not just get them on board, they need to be leaders in this stuff. And that means working with agriculture very closely, working with agricultural organizations and, uh, working together shoulder to shoulder to solve some of these issues. Nobody wants these big catastrophic floods, you know, pouring through their lands. So what do we do? How do we fix this stuff? And yeah. it's all about the right things, the right amounts of the right things in the right locations. Too often our conservation is random. We have a program that'll pay for this or that. And we, you know, we, we wave our flag and say, who wants to sign up? I say that's backwards. We need to get our programs and say, okay, where, are, where do these things most importantly need to be implemented and then work in a targeted manner with landowners to get things on the ground uh, in the right places. We don't have a lot of money to do this stuff, so we gotta spend it wisely. That's right. I know TU National, the national organization is making a, an effort to do this um, across the nation with how we do restoration. Um, they're going to be rolling out. I mean, we're going to take a deep dive state by state and kind of identify some priority watersheds where we want to really concentrate our work over the next five or 10 years where we think we're going to make the biggest difference. Yeah. Um, and then kind of set some goals, go about it, do the work, achieve the goals or reevaluate um, and then set ourselves up to do, you know, the next 10 years worth of work. So we're pretty excited to be to be doing that and taking taking that, you know, that wider view and that longer, longer term view. Um, why don't we do a couple of, uh, Nate had, Nate had an interesting question here. It said, how often will a, a good floodplain get flooded? So like if we had a, a pristine environment in the floodplains where it's supposed to be, right. is that thing going to hold water right. every time it rains? Really good question. Um, and let's go back to Little Plover River for, for an example. Here we had a disconnected floodplain it took a flood of about 70 CFS to engage the floodplain. That's a lot for Little Plover River. When you when they when the hydrologist did the analysis and said analysis and said, okay, what was the natural size of the channel and all these features? 
when would it normally gauge, engage? When at what stage should should that have engaged uh, naturally? And it was like 15 CFS, right? And mm -hmm. it wasn't engaging till 70. So what that translated to on that landscape was, um, you know, water getting out on the floodplain, maybe across the floodplain about every couple of years. So a big flood event. You all you will always have some engagement, but you know, the full engagement in that situation naturally probably occurred about every other spring. Yeah. And lately, though, we've had some big gully washers and it's been engaging a lot, you know, yes. and that thing, everything's changing right now. Some of those old rules about, yeah, um, with these crazy rain events we're having, um, we need to have places to put that water. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's do uh, let's take one more and then maybe we'll wrap it up. Um, this one again from Nate, it says, when we look at these rivers, is there such a thing as a well-placed floodplain? Is there, like, if we're going to go back and, and like, if we're rebuilding the landscape, is there an ideal location for that floodplain? Do you, do you want, like, a wider section on the outside bank as opposed to the inside bank or something like that? Or Yeah. And the, does that the matter? Thing about floodplains, if you do them right, you know, you're, you're literally kind of, what, what you're kind of doing is is allowing the water to get out of the channel and to act in a way that's a little bit unmanaged, right? I mean, there's things we can do to manage it with spillways and, and direct flows and stuff, but you're kind of letting go of control and you're allowing the river to do its thing uh, to adjust to the conditions that it has. And generally speaking, you know, a lot of floodplains are the, the widest floodplains, no surprise, are in the flat portions of your watershed. So if you're looking at a LIDAR map or something like that, and you don't know much yet about what's going on, if you're finding those flat areas, guess what, kids? That's probably uh, historically maybe where you had a floodplain. And then you can look at the channel and say, is it, is it cut way down or is it, is it up high? I mean, are things interacting right? And, and uh, you want to use the features that exist on the landscape because you want to put the stuff back where it existed historically. And that's the best way to handle the flows. So yeah, um, good question, good question. Sounds Oftentimes great. we want to put things in places where they didn't exist historically and we really got to fight with it, right? Because uh, when, you, when you look at that and say, where did the floodplains exist historically? Can we, is it possible to bring them back? That's where we should be emphasizing. That's why I say the right things in the right locations. You want to do other stuff in other areas, you know, depending on what was there in the past. These yeah. rivers and these watersheds have evolved literally over thousands of years since the last glacial times. And, and the evolution of the landscape is, is caused by the flow of water mostly across our, through our watersheds. So that's, the landscape is, is evolved to handle the amount of water that comes down in that area. And the Pinocchio Hills are a great example. You get 200 plus inches of snow every winter at the top of those hills. And you better believe there is a ton of wetlands and a ton of meadows holding water in those trout streams up there. They're all class one trout streams very steep habitat, asked to handle a lot of flow. And it's gorgeous. When, when, when that stuff melts, those wetlands are chock full of water. And it, on top of the hill, it's a 50% wetland landscape up there. Amazing the amount of water that can be held. And that's because it has to, because you get 200 inches of snow up there and evolved over time to create those conditions, so. That sounds great. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up there, Tracy. Thanks again for coming on. And uh, thank you for know, having really, me. Really appreciate you and the work that you do. And and I'm glad that Trout Unlimited has the opportunity to work with your organization, the Wisconsin Wetlands Association, and do the things that we're doing together, like working at the state capitol to educate legislators. And you know, hopefully, we're going to start partnering on more and more of these restoration projects because I think our 
I see so much overlap in, in the interests of both our organizations. So, and, and we're going to be much better off working together um, in the future. So uh, thanks again for coming on. Um, appreciate everybody joining us tonight. And uh, uh, I'm going to record this. We'll put it up on, on YouTube. If anybody wants to go back and see some of Tracy's slides again, um, I'll have it up there in the next day or two. But um, thanks again, everybody. Have a and great feel night. Free to Feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Go on our website, wisconsinwetlands.org, and uh, I'm always happy to answer questions. Or even if you have a situation, if I'm in the area, I can visit areas uh, to talk about uh, different things as well. So I'm, I'm at your disposal. Thank you for all you do for our trout and our water resources, everybody. And uh, we'll see you soon. You bet. Thanks again, Tracy. Thanks, everybody. Bye now. Have a good night.